presentation. It's a great pleasure to be speaking at this seminar. I'm Martin Franklin. I'm at the University of Regina, and I'm interested in uh, operations in homotopy theory, cohomology operations, uh, homotopy operations, and, uh, and such. So I'm going to share my screen now. There we go. Can you see? Yep, that looks great. Fantastic. So the project I'll talk about today is all joint work with uh, Hans-Joachim Bauus. And there's a preprint on the archive with the same title if you want more details. And as the title suggests, it's, um, it's motivated by secondary cohomology operations. But you'll see shortly that it's not actually about secondary cohomology operations. It's, uh, it's really about coherence in track categories. And uh, so it's more of a structural result, but it's part of a broader program that has many computational aspects to it. So I'll mention some of those computational aspects, even though the focus will be structural. So first, a bit of background about secondary cohomology operations and the secondary Steenrod algebra. Well, what is a secondary cohomology operation? There are different approaches to making that precise and rigorous, but the rough idea is that you get a secondary operation whenever you have a relation between two primary operations. In other words, let's look at the setup. Take your favorite spectrum, X, and then three ironbird maclean spectra, or finite products thereof. And then look at a diagram like so. So you have a cohomology class of X, and then a primary operation acting on it, and another primary operation acting on it. But let's assume, moreover, that the twofold composites are, are null homotopic. A and B uh, have a relation. They satisfy a relation. This is saying that the composite is null homotopic. So you can pick a null homotopy as on this diagram. And let's assume, moreover, that the primary operation A kills the cohomology class X. So you can pick a null homotopy as uh, on the picture. And in that setup, you get a total bracket, a threefold total bracket, which uh, you can view as a subset of uh, homotopy classes of maps from the suspension of X into the last spot of the diagram. But let's make that a bit more concrete. Oh, yeah. And if you're so inclined, you can also reduce the indeterminacy by just fixing a specific null homotopy of BA. Uh, that's a technical point. Right, let's make that more concrete with an example of a relation. Fix the prime to be 2. Let's look at the ADEM relation that re-expresses square 2, square 2 uh, as uh, in terms of the admissible uh, basis. And that's the relation that does that. Square 3, square 1 plus square 2, square 2 is 0. How does that fit into the previous framework? Well, I'll abbreviate the ironbird maclean spectrum HF2 by just H. And here's the diagram. Start with any cohomology class of your spectrum X in some degree, N, with mod 2 coefficients. And then you can apply square 1 and square 2 to it. So I'm reading the relation from what you're applying first, you're applying a square one and you're applying a square two. So that lands in that product. And then in the second step, you apply square three and square two. Uh, the notation here is maybe a bit misleading. It's fine in the homotopy category, but uh, later it will be important to distinguish between products and co-products. They're, they're weakly equivalent, but they're not actually the same. But in the homotopy category, you can write this diagram with matrices. And then you get a, a total bracket, a threefold total bracket. Sometimes it's more convenient to have just single copies of HFP and shifts thereof, and then you allow matrix total brackets. But the way I wrote it, it's just a, the usual total bracket. Where does that land? Well, let's see. It lands in maps from the suspension of X into the last spot, and that's giving you the uh, N plus third cohomology group of X. In other words, you get a secondary operation of degree three. 
that's defined on a certain domain, so it's not defined everywhere, only on classes that are killed by both square one and square two. And then it takes values in this uh, cohomology group of X, Hn plus three, but there's indeterminacy. So you can think of that as a quotient of cohomology. That works nicely for threefold brackets, but for longer brackets, it's safer to really think of it as a subset. Like in the previous displayed equation, that's always gonna work. Right. And that's how you get a secondary operation. Now, if you look at the construction, this is saying that all the information you need is maps between ionberg maclean spectra, or finite products thereof, and some null homotopies to exhibit some composites being null. So in particular, if you took all paths between different maps, that would be plenty of information to encode all secondary operations. Let's, uh, let's take this structure as our object of study, I'm going to define what I like to call the Island bird uh, mapping theory. It's a topologically enriched category, or simplicial if you prefer, where you take as objects the finite products of shifts of HFP, and you take the mapping spaces between them. Now, if you want to be technical about it, maybe take some nice simplicial model category of spectra and cofibrant, fibrant models, things like that. So really you want the mapping space to be the correct uh, derived mapping space. All right. And then you don't, well, okay. So if you start with that, that encodes all cohomology operations of all higher orders. So secondary, tertiary, uh, order four, five, six, so all orders are encoded in that gadget EM. But we will focus on secondary operations today. So we just need the maps between einberg maclean spectra and paths or homotopies. In other words, just take the fundamental groupoid of all those mapping spaces. And then you get a groupoid enriched category, which I denote pi one of the topologically enriched category. And we know that all the information is somehow encoded in that groupoid enriched category. So that's our main object of study for today. All right. But now you might think, okay, I know the Steenrod algebra, it's an algebra. Why are you, it's a graded algebra. Why are you looking at this funny category there? And uh, well, here's the relationship. If you take the homotopy category of this ironberg maclean mapping theory, that encodes primary operations in the following sense. It's a category with finite products, also called a, an algebraic theory, or if you prefer, it's a multi-sorted Levier theory, where the sorts are just the degrees. Uh, that's because the Steenrod algebra is a graded algebra. So you have one sort for each natural uh, integer number. And um, this Levier theory, is the theory of modules over the Steenrod algebra, right? And that's the relationship between the two. For computational purposes, it's usually more convenient to work with the algebra, but for structural purposes, like what I'll talk about today, it's more convenient to stay on the category side, which is why I will prefer that unless otherwise noted. Right, in the graded algebra, the Steenrod algebra, the nth uh, degree piece is just given by homotopy classes of maps from HFP to a shift of HFP, which you can think of as just taking the components of the mapping space. So a first attempt at defining what a secondary standard algebra should be morally, well, you could try the same, uh, the same trick here, start with the mapping spaces, and instead of zero truncating, that's a bit too crude, let's one truncate by taking the fundamental groupoid. And that's, that's another way of thinking about this secondary Steenrod algebra, but I'm saying that it's a bit too naive 
because you won't get an actual algebra with that. Uh, composition is not bilinear, and that's the problem we want to fix in this project. So morally, this is doing the right thing, but um, it would be nice to get something where composition is bilinear so that you have an actual algebra. Right. So far, so good. Now this structure that I just described can be replaced by one where composition is bilinear. And uh, Bowes computed the, the, the full structure of the secondary stimulant algebra as a secondary Hopf algebra. Over Z mod P squared, in fact, you can show that there, there is no such secondary Hopf algebra over FP that uh, encodes all secondary operations. So you do need this Z mod P squared. I think it boils down to encoding some box times or, or something like that, but there's a reason. And uh, let's just forget about the Hopf part. Let's focus on the algebra part. What are we saying here? Forget the grading as well. I'm just looking at a one truncated DG algebra. Because an algebra is a zero truncated DG algebra. So we just allow this homological degree to go up to one. So it's concentrated in homological degrees zero and one. That's also sometimes called a pair algebra or some kind of crossed algebra. Uh, right, that's what we're looking at. But then there's this internal degree uh, so that in this secondary Hopf algebra, in each internal degree, let's say n, you have a tiny chain complex of Z mod P squared modules concentrated in homological degrees zero and one. That's the picture. And that construction was, um, was using some kind of free construction. It's pretty big. And uh, Nassau gave a, a much smaller construction. And his paper is uh, also maybe arguably more user friendly. So if you want to start just learning about this, uh, this background on the secondary standard algebra, you can start with uh, Nassau's paper. And uh, it's equivalent to that of, of Bowes. Right? So it's a much smaller presentation. Now, one important step in that, in that computation of the secondary student algebra was replacing what you get from nature, this strange structure that's not bilinear, by one that is bilinear. That's what we call strictification. You want to strictify the bilinearity of multiplication. So in that context, you, you could phrase the strictification result from, from Baus's work as saying that this groupoid enriched category is weakly equivalent as a, as a groupoid enriched category to a DG category over Z mod P squared that's one truncated in the sense that each mapping chain complex is concentrated in degrees zero and one. It, today, all my chain complexes will be non-negatively graded starting degree zero. Or that, that's the category description. If you prefer the algebra description, it's what I was saying earlier. It's a, it's a differential bigraded algebra whose homological degree is concentrated in degrees zero and one. So just a bunch of tiny chain complexes. All right. So that's the background on this secondary C0 algebra. Uh, listing the complete structure is, uh, yeah, it's pretty big, but it's there. Now, what is this project about, since that was all achieved in the book from 2006? Well, the first observation is that this strictification result doesn't really have anything to do with secondary cohomology operations. It's really just a fact about coherence in track categories. So we wanna, first of all, highlight, isolate this, this part of the argument and make it clear that it's really just about having certain tracks satisfying certain coherence equations, and then you can strictify. 
And by doing that, then you get a more general result that just uses minimal assumptions. I'll, I'll make that more, uh, more convincing later. And also in our approach, we, uh, we use a different method. Namely, we don't use any, uh, any baus wirschen cohomology, which was uh, an important ingredient in, in Baus's original work. And our motivation for a, a longer term goal would be to adapt that stratification approach to tertiary operations. Maybe some of you have, have heard me talk about that before. It's something on our mind. And uh, now with this project, we have all the ingredients in place to adapt the approach to tertiary operations. Hi, Martin, this is Dan. Um, by tertiary operations, you mean like the fourfold to total brackets? Yeah, that, exactly. So the uh, tertiary operations, the prototypical example would be a fourfold total bracket of okay. three consecutive uh, primary operations and then okay. plug in your cohomology class in the fourth spot. Okay. Uh, yep, exactly. Right. So, so in our other projects, part of this program, uh, we have an algebraic structure that encodes tertiary operations. We have the, the two tracks that would allow us to strictify. And now we have the method that we should follow if we want to adapt the, the same approach. So, right, that's, but that's uh, not worked out yet, not fully. All right, let me tell you a bit about those linearity tracks, those correction tracks. As I mentioned earlier, the problem with this ironberg mclean mapping theory is that composition is not bilinear. Not strictly. It is up to homotopy. After all, the stereotype algebra is an algebra, so that's fine. But it's even better than that because there are models of einberg maclean spectra as strict abelian group objects in spectra, and that makes it easy to just add pointwise in the target. And automatically, you get half of bilinearity, namely if you write it in compositional order, it's the left variable. So you compose your cohomology class and your primary operation, and then composition is strictly left linear because you just add everything pointwise in the target. But right linear up to homotopy, and the same problem is true already at the, at the secondary level in this uh, fundamental groupoid, you'll need some, uh, some path to correct between the two sides of the equation that doesn't hold strictly. Right, let's describe in, in more detail the structure that's present in this groupoid enriched category. Well, first of all, that's called a track category. That just means enriched in groupoids. We call the tracks uh, the, the two morphisms, if you're thinking of it too categorically. There are the two morphisms. If you think of it topologically, they're the homotopy classes of homotopies. Those are tracks. They're denoted with this double arrow for the rest of the talk. Compose them, I'll use box for the concatenation of paths. Or if you think too categorically, that's the vertical composition, like in this picture. But in general, we just want to omit the, the objects in the background. Uh, if we can. And so I just write a diagram of tracks. There are some placeholder objects in the background that don't really play a role. So I'll be using those little track diagrams like at the bottom. Right? That's track category. And we're interested in the, the additive structure that's present in there. Let's talk about linearity. Track category is left linear. All right, we're having some kind of point in each mapping space. And, oh, hang on a second, Martin. We're having, we had a, like a little um, internet lag yeah. there, but I think we're back now. So, okay, all right, keep going. Okay. Is it fine now? Yeah, it sounds, seems fine now. Oh, okay, all right. So yeah, maybe I should have connected a cable instead of Wi-Fi, but let's, let's uh, give it a try. Okay, uh, enrich and pointed groupoids. So you have those base points in each mapping space and multiplying by a base point gives you a base point. So they're strict zero morphisms. But then you have the additive 
structure. So each mapping groupoid is an abelian group object in groupoids, based at zero. All right. So in other words, you also have strict zeros for the addition. Adding zeros is strictly not changing your map. And finally, as the name suggests, you want composition to be left linear. I'm just writing down the properties that our motivational example satisfies. This uh, track category or track theory of secondary operations. And here's a, an interesting variant. The same is true if you take HZ instead of HFP. Maybe more exotic. We don't really compute with integral operations as often, but uh, it's there and it satisfies the same formal properties. So we'll remember that later. Uh, the, the integral Stevie-Mott algebra is also dealt with in this context. But our composition was right linear up to homotopy. Now we want to exhibit that by a convenient choice of homotopy. So a linearity track is just a track that exhibits the right linearity up to homotopy, a track of that form at the bottom. All right. Now, why was composition right linear up to homotopy in, in our motivational example? Hmm. Well, let's see. It's really because of stability. Because we're working in spectra, we can use stability, and products are weak coproducts in the sense that if you take the, um, the two inclusions, so the inclusion IA here denotes uh, the identity on A and zero in the B component. We do have some base points, so you can just plug in a zero there. So in other words, I think of that as the wedge inclusion in the product, although I'm not saying that there are coproducts, because in our example, there are no coproducts in the ambient track category. But you can still restrict along those two, uh, those two copies of the objects. And then you get an equivalence of groupoids. Saying that you have a strict or strong coproducts would be saying that you get an isomorphism of groupoids. That's the distinction. But that's good enough for our purposes. Look at this diagram there. One composite is A applied to X plus Y. The other composite is AX plus AY. So those are the two sides of the equation we're trying to compare with a correction track. And it suffices to do it for the universal case where uh, XY is the identity. In other words, just correct the homotopy commutativity of the square part. And in fact, there's a canonical way of doing that. Among all tracks of that shape, pick the unique one that restricts to the constant track on the wedge sitting inside A cross A. That's what those equations mean. Oh, id box is um, it's the identity for the vertical composition. So the, the constant path at A is what it means. All right, so we have those canonical correction tracks. Then you post compose to get them in general. And that system of linearity tracks is, uh, is very nice in that it satisfies a bunch of coherence conditions, which we call the linearity track equations. They're very reasonable equations. Uh, you pre-compose by a map, you can just factor it out. You post-compose, you need to work a little bit more, but that's, it's what you would hope for. The two ways of getting from the top left to the top right agree. Then what else is there? Addition was assumed to be strictly commutative. And you want to take advantage of that with the symmetry equation. Then everything was left linear. So those correction tracks ought to be left linear as well. There's nothing to correct there. Then if you're adding more than two elements, you have this associativity equation. 
So all reasonable equations and then naturality as well. If you change your cohomology classes by homotopies, then uh, you get this commutative diagram of tracks. And likewise, if you change your primary operation by a homotopy to a different but homotopic operation, that should be compatible via this diagram. So they're all reasonable equations, something you would expect. And it turns out that that's all we need for the strictification. Well, I've been telling you that you can compare this track category to a DG category. How does that work? We had a track category where each mapping groupoid is an abelian group object in groupoids. But that, concretely, is the same as a one truncated chain complex, concentrated in degrees zero and one uh, of abelian groups, in this case. And it's just the usual Doltcon, well, it's the, it's the bottom part of the Doltcon correspondence where uh, you send a groupoid to its, uh, its normalized chain complex or more chain complex. You keep the part in, in degree zero, the objects, and then you take the kernel of say the source and restrict the target or vice versa. The way I wrote it here, I'm, uh, let's see, I'm looking at the kernel of the source map and restricting the target map. So you just do the normalized chain complex construction. And using that equivalence, you can think of a less linear track category, which happens to be right linear. That's the same thing as a one truncated DG category. That's not completely obvious because if you replace each individual mapping groupoid, it looks like that. Uh, but then you might worry about the, the monoidal properties. And the issue is that this equivalence is not a monoidal equivalence, but almost. It's lacks in both directions and the, and the co-unit. Well, co-unit and unit are both lax. I think co-unit is actually strictly or strong monoidal. And the other one is, is uh, close enough to being uh, monoidal to give you uh, this identification. So it's fine. If you have one of those gadgets like we had before, a track category with this local linear data, you can just replace those mapping groupoids by little chain complexes. Right, in that sense, you can ask whether such a left linear track category is equivalent to a DG category. And if you start with a left linear track category and you have a system of correction tracks, like we had before, satisfying this list of seven reasonable equations, then the track category is equivalent, weakly equivalent to a one truncated DG category. That's our main result. It's, uh, yeah, it's generalizing Baus's original strictification result for that specific track category that had those features. And when I say weakly equivalent, it's um, in the sense that you would expect. So uh, a track functor that's locally linear, so it's linear in each mapping groupoid, n is a Dwyer Kahn equivalence, that's a weak equivalence, and then allow zigzags thereof. All right. Oh, and then there was also this counterpart where is a mod, the secondary C0 algebra mod P is uh, strictifiable over Z mod P squared, and that's also the case here. So if every morphism in your track category happens to be killed by P, it's, it's P torsion, killed by a single power of P, then we get this analogous statement that uh, the track category is equivalent to a one truncated DG category over the ground ring Z mod P squared. And uh, this certainly recovers the 
the original strictification result, but it also works for the integral secondary steam rod algebra. So this is, uh, as far as I know, uh, not covered by other, other generalizations. You get this secondary integral steam rod algebra, and it is also strictifiable. For the same reason that the, the mod P is secondary steam rod algebra was strictifiable because of those correction tracks. All right. Now let me sketch how the proof goes. It goes in three steps. Uh, you first construct some, uh, some pseudo functor from uh, a pretty big category. Um, the way that works is you start, so concretely in the Steenrod algebra case, you would start by picking generators of the Steenrod algebra as an FP algebra. So take, for example, square one, square two, square three, etc. And then you look at the tensor algebra over that set of generators, uh, on that set of generators, over the ground ring Z mod P squared with its canonical augmentation. So it's pretty huge at that point. And then by some, some pullback construction, you can uh, promote that to a uh, one truncated DG category. So morally what it's doing, yeah, it's a, it's a pullback. So it's taking one of those words in Steenrod operations along with uh, a null homotopy. It's encoding relations and encoding why some relations hold. By, by picking specific null homotopies. And then if your instruction was, was done right, you get a pseudo Dwyer Kahn equivalence, but then by some two categorical argument, you get a, a weak equivalence in a two-step zigzag by some kind of cofibrant resolution. So that's uh, an argument that's, at least I, I so Emily Real pointed that out when we discussed, and I, I found a good exposition in LAC. It might be due to someone before, I'm not sure, but certainly in some of uh, Stephen LAC's papers, it's uh, explained. And we need to adapt it because we need a locally linear version of that, where all the, the track functors respect the addition on each of those mapping group words. But it's the same idea. All right, and this third step is completely different from the original argument, which was saying that you get an equivalence of homotopy theories because there's some, some k invariant that's preserved by the pseudo functor, some k invariant living in bowes virchen cohomology of the respective homotopy theories. So it's a, it's a completely different approach. All right, this is a computational homotopy theory seminar. So as promised, I'll say a few words about uh, how this relates to computational problems. Well, first, there are some computational approaches to proving the strictification theorem. Namely, Bowes and Pirashvili proved a generalization uh, as follows. The setup was, was phrased slightly differently, but the, the crux of the matter is that if in the homotopy category, all the Hamm abelian groups are two torsion, so they're all F2 vector spaces, or all of them uh, are Z adjoin one half modules. In other words, two acts invertibly on all those mapping abelian groups. Then your track category was strictifiable. And that generalizes the original strictification result because think about the mod P steam rod algebra, it's an FP algebra. So if P is odd, two X invertibly on all those FP vector spaces, and uh, if P is two, well, everything is two torsion. So that covers all cases. However, it does not cover the case of the integral steam rod algebra and its secondary uh, enhancement. 
So that's one perk of this method using the correction tracks, the linearity tracks. You get a uniform argument also for the integral of steenode algebra. And this was computational in nature. Their generalization relies heavily on some computations in Hochschild homology, uh, cohomology, uh, McLean cohomology, Schukla cohomology, and, <clears throat> and uh, Bowes-Virchen cohomology. So it was uh, completely different methods, computational, uh, not using the calculus of tracks. Now this uh, strictification business also has applications towards a more computational direction. In fact, that was the, the main motivation to begin with. For instance, you can compute some messy products in the homotopy category using the strictification. More concretely, if we think of the Steenrod algebra, this is saying that this secondary Steenrod algebra can compute all threefold messy products in the Steenrod algebra. So, for instance, I'm going to use the Milner basis for elements in the Steenrod uh, algebra. You have this threefold Massey product, square 0, 1, 2, which is in this threefold uh, Massey product. And this example is, is nicely explained in, uh, in uh, Nassau's paper and also in Baus's book. So that's something you can, you can uh, compute directly from the secondary Steenrod algebra. And another uh, motivation was to compute the Adams differential, D2. And Adams already pointed out in his papers that D2 is really a secondary operation. And in fact, you can use that to compute D2 in the HFP-based Adams spectral sequence that was done by Bowes and Gibladze. And the idea is that the secondary cohomology of your spectrum is a module over the secondary steroid algebra. Whatever those words mean together, it means roughly what you think it does. And you can also strictify the secondary cohomology of, of a spectrum using the same machinery. So that's not a problem. And then you uh, run some, some homological algebra, just fancier secondary homological algebra. And if you look at what happens, D2 is, is a certain specific representative of a threefold total bracket of the form uh, a primary operation, a primary operation, and the class, some class you're acting on. So it looks like the secondary operations we talked about at the beginning, uh, which are threefold total brackets. All right, thank you for your attention. All right. I'm mute everyone so we can thank him first of all. Okay. Then I'm going to go back and mute everyone again um, and open it up to questions. So if you've got a question, you could raise your hand, you could just unmute your mic and chirp up. All right, well, I've got a question, which is, I want to go back to this D2s that you were talking about. So I, I was a little unclear whether, what you know, you're saying that the D2s are somehow sort of in the, you know, are encoded in the secondary steroid algebra information. Is that like, to what extent is that a philosophical statement rather than like a practical, like computational statement? Like, can you find the D2 on H4 is H not H3 squared? Can you actually like see that like concretely? Or, right. no, it's there, um, but I mean, you know. So right, it's there in principle, that, that much is uh, it's relatively clear. But to actually compute it, that's, um, that's what they worked out. So Bowes and Gibladze. And there's also a preprint it was not uh, published, but they, they run some computations. So the, the, those ideas can be turned into a concrete algorithm, but it's pretty involved. Um, I, I, I'd have to uh, look more carefully at the details to really carefully understand how the algorithm works. But um, I just know that roughly it, it starts with um, this, uh, this resolution, Re-resolution of the secondary cohomology. 
Okay. And then related to that, then the higher differentials are then supposed to be in, you know, like the D3s are supposed to be associated to the tertiary C-word algebra and... Right, right, exactly. So we have, we have, um, well, I, I guess Maunder's result from the 60s says that DR is an rth order cohomology operation in some precise sense. Yeah. Uh, for him, it was, uh, I think, the, in the sense of pyramids or something like that. Okay. And uh, so Dan Christensen and I have also worked out a version of Maunder's theorem in a triangulated category. So if you work with the atom spectral sequence in a triangulated category, you also have that structural feature. But computing uh, those differentials is, is still hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Other questions? Okay, if not, I'll, let's un, I'm going to unmute everyone so we can thank him one more time. Okay, great. Um, and so that's it for today's seminar.